and you are a model for wealth. And if you can share that with the generations coming behind you, maybe they'll get to where you are quicker and progress can be sustainable in our community. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey guys, before we get into today's episode, I wanted to quickly address something. So, you know, coming off the live show, I contemplated laying low for the rest of the year, but I have been getting a bunch of DMs and emails from people asking me, when is your next podcast training? I even did a poll on Instagram stories last week and asked, should I do another podcast training? And the answer was a resounding 100% yes. So how can I ignore that? I am going to be doing one more training for the year as requested before the year is out. If you are ready to start playing big, get those ideas out of your head and finally launch your own podcast, then I'm here to help. My next podcast training, How to Grow Your Brand Through Podcasting, is happening this Thursday, October 24th. Register at podcastmoguls.com. So if I, I'm an introvert, I'm a homebody who likes to play on the internet, if I can launch my podcast and grow it to over 2 million downloads and attract speaking engagements, TV appearances, and host a live show in front of people, so can you with the right amount of discipline, consistency consistency, and hustle. So come on down to my next training this Thursday, October 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern so I can teach you all of my strategies. Register at podcastmoguls.com. Again, if you're ready to launch and grow your own podcast, save your seat right now at podcastmoguls.com. I'll see you in class. All right, all right. Now let's get into today's episode. Today, we are exploring a topic that is near and dear to my heart. It's something I personally am very focused on learning as much as possible about, and that is legacy wealth building in the African-American community. And there is no better person to break down this topic than today's guest, Dr. Pamela Jolly. Dr. Jolly is a graduate of Hampton University, the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, Boston University School of Theology, and the Graduate Theological Foundation. She started her career in banking and eventually saw a need to leverage all of her corporate experiences to assist minority business enterprises to grow. So in 2004, she launched Torch Enterprises, Inc., a firm committed to developing minority enterprises capable of arriving at legacy wealth, both individually and corporately for their communities. For over a decade, she has been committed to developing data-driven strategies that lead to wealth as a legacy in the African-American community. She is the author of the book, The Narrow Road, A Guide to Legacy Wealth, and Dr. Jolly uses her extensive background in financial services, strategy, community development, and theology to help entrepreneurs and organizations succeed. So in today's episode, we get into why you need to have a good relationship with time, to have a good relationship with money, why wealth is more than money and how we can all begin to build and chart our path to wealth. So let's get right into it. So welcome to the guest chair, Dr. Jolly. I'm so glad to be here, Nikayla. I'm very glad to have you. As you know, this is a conversation, long overdue conversation, really, that needed to happen on Side Hustle Pro. But before we get into more about our talk about wealth and generational wealth, I want to learn a little bit more about your background. So you began your career in banking. Why banking? So why banking? Uh, It's so funny. I was just having a conversation about this. Um, I went to Hampton University and I was a daddy's girl and my daddy bought me a car. And I had a boyfriend at Morgan State University, which is in Baltimore. And I snuck and drove up to Baltimore and had an accident and totaled what was the second car in six months. And it was around the same time as A Different World. I'm dating myself, but A Different World was out. And (laughs) and Whitley's father had cut up all of her credit cards. And so my dad had saw that and he was like, clearly you want to be on the road more in the classroom. And so he withdrew all financial support 
<clears throat> and so I went from pretty much a life of luxury to have to working full full time and going to school full time. And I was a Circuit City 100% sales commission associate in car stereo. And Hampton is a military town. If you wanted a system that would win some awards in the military town, you came to me. And I just was so positive on if I understood what you needed, I could sell you the right equipment. And so I sold about $35,000 worth of car stereo equipment a month. Whoa. (laughs) And at that time, Circuit City was amazing because you had to learn the margins and the splits and the histories of all of the products and the companies. And it was just phenomenal. And Sylvester Jones was the manager and he had me go on the back and learn how to install the stuff. So I knew how to put the subwoofers together with the tweeters and oh, it was just powerful. But anyway, when I went to graduate, um, my cousin called me and said, what are you going to do? I said, guess what? I just got a full-time offer to be a sales manager at Circuit City. And he was like, what? (laughs) He was just like, why? I said, he said, so you are a good salesperson? I said, oh my goodness, I'm the best. And he said, well, why don't you try selling the hardest product out there? And I said, what's that? And he said, money, because everybody's money is green. And I said, is that legal? And he said, yes, it's banking. And I was like, I don't know anything about that. And so he said, don't you worry. So he went through his Rolodex. He was a banker at the time. Next thing you know, I had four or five interviews. And next thing you know, I was a sales, um, a credit analyst at Nations Bank. So after undergrad, you went straight into Nations Bank. Exactly. And so Hugh McCall, who's a fourth generation banker, um, and I'll never forget when I first met him, he was just an amazing man. And he said, I want to own the largest bank in America. And he was a fourth generation banker. He acquired over 93 financial institutions and knitted them together to create, which is now Bank of America, then Nations Bank. Changed laws, did a variety of different things. And to be able to learn under him in a rotation program really taught me growth through acquisition. And so uh, it just really, really gave me a clear understanding of the role of business and finance and spreads and understanding your numbers and underwriting credit uh, really plays in building wealth. And now you, you know, I know you've gone on to work other jobs since then, but ultimately ended up going back. You have your going back to grad school. You have your MBA from the Wharton School of Business an MTS from Boston University School of Theology and an ED. <laughs> now I'm going to mess this up. You have your PhD yeah. as well. Yes. What inspired you to explore these various degrees and how did each tie into your ultimate mission? Yeah, so my godfather, um, my father's best friend, Charles Brumell, was awarded in class of 72. And he was the first African-American executive vice president for Bank of America in their real estate bank first and then their wealth management department. And he was always the brilliant one. And my dad was brilliant in a different way. My dad was a technologist. And that's why I learned how to type my name before I learned how to write it. And then my mom was brilliant in a different way because she was an oncology nurse. But they were all these different types of brilliance. But there was something about Uncle Charles where he could connect the dots and do some things. And so once I understood where he went, and then I had a boyfriend who I loved who was applying to business school. And I was like, what's that? So by the time I figured it all out, The only school I wanted to go to was the Wharton School. And so after four years of working at Nations Bank and learning what I could learn um, under Hugh McCall um, and some amazing people there, um, I went to Wharton. And Wharton, before I launched my company, was the hardest and best two years of my life. It was like drinking water through a fire hose. And I majored in finance and strategy. And Wharton really helped me unlock my genius code. But then once I left Wharton, I went back into financial services. And when I launched my company, um, one of the largest clients, the first largest clients I had was FEMA, post-Katrina. And that's when I got to work with the finance and the strategy side of my career in a community that I loved because it was a community that looked like me. But I saw that there was a lot of closing your eyes and believing that things were going to be okay. And so when I went to the pastors and said, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we elevate the standard of business here to wealth? Then what they often said to me was, you clearly love business and you know God, but you don't know God the way we know God. And Mm. it was this currency of faith that was operating as one of the primary variables in the wealth equation 
that I needed to better have a, a better way to be able to engage people of faith around wealth. And so I learned best in a classroom. And so I commuted between New Orleans and Boston, and I went to seminary, and I got a master's of systematic theology. And what's beautiful about Boston is you can go to all the different seminaries there. So I got to study at Harvard and Boston College and um, uh, what's, the, what's the other one? Four or two other seminaries. That, MIT? Or, no, oh, no, no. no. So, it, it's a, it, so they call it the Boston Theological Institute. Oh, okay. And literally, you're able to Gordon Cromwell and then Andover Newton. And Andover Newton, I actually lived on their campus, and they have the oldest theological library in the country. And I love libraries. So I got to really just do some deep dive studies in the last 180 years of the Black church. Um, Boston University is where the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King went. And aside from Stanford, that's the largest archival data of Mar Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And he went to Boston for Boston personally. So I was able to study really how he viewed theology and how that translated into the civil rights movement. And so it just opened my eyes. And then Dr. Peter Paris, who was on loan from Princeton at Harvard, who taught me liberation theology and black theology, said, you got to get a terminal degree. And I was like, what is that? Because by this time I had three degrees. And he's like, you have to get a doctorate because you have to teach this conversion, this integration of faith and finance and business in the black community that you love so much. And if you got the terminal degree, you would you would go a terminal degree, a doctorate is when you go to the end of knowledge and you become an expert. And so um, that's why I got the doctorate and I got the doctorate in a very unique way. I went to the Graduate Theological Seminary and Institute, and it was a, cons a consortium program. So I was able to study at Oxford University School of Theology at Christ Church. I was able to study at Yale and Princeton and Loyola and the various different schools because I needed to knit together a dissertation committee that could understand the different aspects of what I was putting together. And so, um, and then add that with the research. So I learned best in a classroom. And so the structure and the assignments and experts looking over your shoulder to ensure that you are doing things with a specific outcome and a purpose are requirements for me. And so that's why I have so many degrees. And, you know, something you said um, really stuck out to me, and I want to go back for a second. You talked about you notice this trend or this theme of us closing our eyes and kind of hoping things would all work out. And I know when you, you're you talking about closing your eyes, you're specifically referring to how we're taught to pray and, you know, pray, hope. And of course, I, you know, I know we're both uh, firm believers in the power of prayer. But that said, there's this tendency in our African-American community to close our eyes, pray and hope for the best. Do you think in any way that is somehow related to uh generational wealth and, and what we've seen thus far in our overall worth, you know, the, the average worth of an African-American woman, for example. So if I could just make sure that I understand your question, because yeah. my dissertation was really focused on unblinding one's faith. Right. And I mean that we just close our eyes and believe. And this is what I found. I interviewed over 7,000 African-Americans. And what I found is that when it, just about anyone was faced with an, a life uncertainty or a financial <laughs> uncertainty, they closed their eyes and they believed in something, right? right? Now, as believers, you and I, we believe in the God above. Some folks believe in themselves. They believe in their knowledge. They believe in their social network. But that belief, that faith is a currency. And what I wanted to do was unblind that faith with business, <laughs> finance, and strategy. Now, your specific question is the, the worshiping of money. So in the Bible, it says that the love of money is the root of all evil. However, it's the love of money, the love of money over all things. And so for me, the way I teach about money, all money is, is your time times an hourly or an annual wage. So if you don't have a good relationship with money, you really don't have a good relationship with time. And literally, we all have a window of time to produce much fruit. In the Bible, specifically in Deuteronomy 8.18, you know, God gives us the responsibility to produce wealth as it, it was promised to our ancestors. So I don't really think it's the worshiping of money that is holding our community back. Here's what I think it is. 
or the fear of worshiping money? I think I think unconsciously a lot of us do worship money um, because we limit God to a miracle. And that miracle is paying a bill or helping us get a car when God can do so much more. I think what's holding us back is we don't understand our history. I just left Bennett College, the first um, all-girl African-American historically black college. And literally in 1972, the year I was born, the United Methodist Church women pulled capital together to be able to support the school. The first, the, you know, when they were started five years post-emancipation, emancipated slaves pulled capital together in the amount of $10,000 and acquired the 55 acres that Bennett sits on now, which is an opportunity zone. So in our history is proof that we have right relationship with money, God, business, and building community. But oftentimes we focus on the last decade and the last decade shows that we can consume. And so literally, which is really only one variable in the GDP, right? Consumption, savings, investing, in, imports and exports. So when you lo- limit your definition of power to buying, you lose your power when you can no longer afford to buy. And you limit your life to a life of consumption so that money is your ruler. But when you know that life is so much more than that, Lord have mercy, we can talk about the power of what business is, which is just a series of relationships that get increasingly intimate and build more and more value, which produces more and more wealth. So we've spoken about this before. You often say wealth is more than money. What exactly do you mean by that? So the way that I teach um, a pursuit of wealth is called the narrow road. And as I said briefly before, money in my equation for wealth is just 20 percent of the full equation which is money is just your time times an hourly or an annual wage. But we've got a total of five capitals in our portfolio of assets, if you will. We've got cultural capital, how we were raised, the unique way that we look at things. We have intellectual capital, whether it's store-bought knowledge in a classroom or learned experience on your job and in community. We have um, social capital. And some of us are more adept at leveraging our social capital than others, where we don't just, you know, like to hang out with people or like to have likes on Facebook. We truly build relationships that are capable of building value and building wealth for both parties from a mutual beneficial perspective. And then the fifth one is we have um, uh, spiritual capital. Because what, however you define it, whatever your faith tradition allows you to believe in, as a theologian, you know, religion is what you do about God. That's your business. Spirituality is what you feel about God. Again, your business. Theology is what you think about both, which can be a way for us to grow together. Where if I understand how you believe and how your belief influences your actions and you understand how I believe and how my belief influences my actions, then perhaps some of these actions we can do together. And we can have a shared theology of how we can grow together. And so literally that, that, that faith, that spiritual capital, that is a currency that gets you to the end of a road when you have run out of your own resources. And so if we have a shared faith, oh, my Lord, I mean, I might not completely understand your whole road, but if I believe in your outcome, I may invest in you. And so that spiritual capital is a very powerful capital as well. So when you take full ownership of your portfolio of assets, your life is different. It's not limited to just how much time you have in a day, how much money you can make in a week. It expands to the relationships you have, to the knowledge that you can apply, to the culture that you have inherited, and to the faith that leads you. And so it's a fulfilled life. That's why for me, a fulfilled life is a wealthy life. It, it, it's not the rigmarole. It's not the, the hustle and bustle. I mean, it's saying, you know what? Here is me, all of me. And I want to be better than the generation that came before me. And I want to maximize all of these assets within me. So I've got to be able to look for unique ways in which I can package them and bring them to the market, whether I call that my community, whether I call that my industry, and take it to another level. That's definitely one of the things that you have impressed upon me is this idea that we need to take full possession of the business of us. And when you say that, can you break it down a little bit more? So you now mentioned the five assets, so to speak, that we have that 
comprise wealth. It's not just money. You know, it's our social, our um, how we were raised, all of these different things. Now, how can I, as Nikayla, begin to capitalize on all of these to make myself have a more fulfilled life, aka become more wealthy? Yeah, so Nikayla, there's four primary steps along the narrow road. If you take these steps, each step has an outcome, and that's how you get to the five steps. The first step is to create a life, and you create a life with your human capital to earn an income. And your job at the Create a Life stage is to build a portfolio of talents in a way in which you can have increasing income year after year, right? So you're going to work for, you know, on average 40 years. And so when you look at that 40-year journey, what talents are you going to use? What are your core strengths? What what is your genius code? How are you going to put all the things that are within you together and package them up and say, this is me, I'm an asset, and I'm an asset that can work with others and work for myself. That's the first step. The second step is once you're clear on that, like once you know what you can do better than anybody else, now you got to build a lifestyle that you can sustain beyond retirement. Because let me tell you something, you don't want to work and then die. I don't. I want to work, I want to play, but then I want to retire and pass the torch to you youngins and I want to enjoy my life. I don't want to have to be broke at the end after working so hard for the peak earning years of my life. So you got to really have a lifestyle budget and some a savings and an investment plan that really makes sense. That third step is now you got to grow independent. Because truth be told, if you want to do what you want to do when you want to do it, you got to be able to afford it. And it's very difficult to be able to do that in America without ownership. And so you have to have a plan for independence. For some of us, that independence is going to include the acquisition of our inheritance, which means you've got to stay close to your family who own things so that you will inherit those things and be a part of their retirement plan or a part of your grandparents' transition plan. Because it does take three generations to build legacy wealth and only one generation to lose it. And that fourth step is you have to leave an inheritance. And it's easier to leave an inheritance when you know that you have received an inheritance, which is why the generations have to stay connected. And yes, it is amazing to leave a financial inheritance, but that's not the only way you leave an inheritance. You made some mistakes and you had some successes. You learned some things and you are a model for wealth. And if you can share that with the generations coming behind you, maybe they'll get to where you are quicker And progress can be sustainable in our community. So how do you build wealth? Earn increasing levels of income. Build a lifestyle budget where you have sustainable cash flow and a way to be able to finance your retirement. Own something and leave an inheritance. Of course, you can add to that plan a whole bunch of sexy wealth management products. But if you own those four steps and get to a level of confidence, Find a financial professional and have a conversation of better ways to be able to do what you've already figured out. Thank you for breaking that down. And by the way, guys, Dr. Jolly is the author of The Narrow Road, A Guide to Legacy Wealth. And so she created the Narrow Road methodology and has broken this down even further in this book, which I will link to. So what inspired you to even write the book? As uh, Was this part of your uh, dissertation? So, yes, it was a way for me to be able to streamline the five terabytes of data that I did in my research, my quantitative and qualitative research. But it was also that, listen, you know, when we think about African-American businesses, so it's reported that we have about 2.6 million African-American businesses, less than 100,000 of them are profitable and pay people. And if we really want wealth to be a standard in our community, we have to understand that the primary purpose of business is to build wealth. But if we can't define it for ourselves, it's very difficult for it to be attainable in our lifetime in a realistic way. And if I don't attain it, the generations coming behind me won't want to do it because it just seems like it's something we talk about, but we never pursue. And so I wanted to raise capital and awareness for African-American businesses. But as someone who has worked in the private equity venture capital space and most recently got another certification in venture capital and private equity, the level of intimacy that people jump into to get VC or private equity money, depending on the type of enterprise that you have, oftentimes a lot of people in my community run away from those questions or they don't understand them and go blindly into them and don't realize the implications or the consequences of the decisions that they blindly make. 
And so we needed to build wealth our way, which means that we needed to have an investor mindset and feel more comfortable with trusting each other with risk and opportunity. And so I had to focus on the business of you, your personal business first, and make sure that was at a standard of wealth for me to ever think that we could raise enough capital for ourselves to start to make standards in our business lives that really realize some real sustainable wealth that can pass on for generations. One of my favorite things that you say, Dr. Jolly, is you talk about the fact that you are passionate about raising capital and awareness for Black people, specifically because we were the first assets on the balance sheet and therefore we are wealth. I love that. (laughs) Can you speak a bit more about the role of legacy in our pursuit of wealth? I know you touched on it a bit in us knowing our history, but truly, sometimes it can be daunting to see the stats and to feel like we are at such a deficit. We are so far behind. What is the role of legacy? So it's interesting. I mean, in the Bible, it says, look look not to the left or the right and acknowledge God in all thy ways and he will direct your steps. And what I want to share with the African-American community is that you can compare yourself to the broader society if you want to, or you could understand that the way forward is back through. And so we sit at a very big inflection point in our history. In 2019, the first slaves came to America in 1619. So we've been on this 400 year journey When we first came over here as assets on the balance sheet, African-Americans are the only people in America who were first capital before they made capital, who were first traded before they ever could trade. And so when we look at business, it can't help but be personal because we were it. Aside from the stolen land, we were the largest asset. And so that part of our inherited legacy is real. And when you look at the issues that we find in our communities, one of the things that really gives me hope is that it's patterned. So if we can get it right in Detroit, we can get it right in Cleveland. If we can get it right in Cleveland, we can get it right in Oakland. If we can get it right in Oakland, we can get it right in New York. And so literally, it's not anything new. 80% of our problems are the same. What's different is the way that which we look at it. And if you're not connected to the generations who have come before you from a business perspective, you might think that what you're going through is something new. And it's not. It's something continued. And so what I've been challenging communities across the country to do is to work with me to let's do a 400 year reset for 400 years. We've gone through some pattern circles in a financial wilderness. Let's exit. Let's get to the promised land. Let's take possession of it. Let's own it. And let's start to materialize communities that matter to us because it's a mutual benefit. When you have a wealthy community, guess what? It pays taxes and it makes everyone prosperous. And so literally a wealthier black community would be a wealthier America. And so for me, let's do it. And so that's what I've been challenging people to do. And so understanding your legacy, legacy is a narrative that did not start with you and will not end with you unless you disconnect your story from the narrative. Your story has a beginning, a middle and an end. And if I sit there long enough, you'll tell me it over and over and over again. Conversely, if you can connect it to a legacy, I mean, for me, I don't want you to talk to me. I don't want to talk. I don't want you to understand me and have the story begin with me. I want it to begin with my great grandmother, a sharecropper and her daughter, my grandmother, who was the live in maid for Mayor Dilworth in Philadelphia who invested in her, her, her brothers and sisters to migrate from the Jim Crow South up to Philadelphia. I want you to know where I came from so you can understand why I think some things are possible that you might think are impossible. And you, understanding where you came from, might start to look at the things that are in your way as indicators that you have arrived at the point of your promised land. And so it is so important that we connect the dots Otherwise, we're repeating mistakes and we're staying in circular patterns that need to stop, which is why I'm calling for a reset. And speaking of those circular mistakes, I love the fact that along the narrow road, one of the steps is to leave behind what we have learned. And a lot of times when we think of an inheritance, leaving an inheritance, we do think of money. We think of cash. We think, oh, our kids need to have a trust fund and things of that nature. But 
We take for granted the knowledge that we now have. The next generation needs to see. And I want to know what's the best way that you think we can do these things? Like, are there methods that are best that you recommend to share this knowledge from generation to generation? Because we know methods of technology change. We know things change. And not every family has a historian. So how do we begin to make sure we keep this knowledge throughout the generations? So in 2018, it was a year of demonstration and preparation for me. Torch is now 15 years old. And so in 2018, it was a year of demonstration and preparation. What I mean by that is I launched the Legacy Wealth Initiative. And with that, I had two pilot projects. One was the Omaha Legacy Wealth Initiative and the Black Male Equity Initiative. The Black Male Equity Initiative was in Detroit in partnership with the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And the Omaha Legacy Wealth Initiative was in Omaha in partnership with Willie Barney and the Empowerment Network. And those two groups of those two cohorts journeyed the narrow road. Now, both of them published anthologies in partnership with my company, Torch Enterprises. Why do I say all that? The Sankofa View, which is the published book of the Omaha Legacy Wealth Initiative, has a series of questions that you can start to begin to ask your family members, your elders, to start to build a legacy narrative so that you can start to get really clear about where it is. And here's the beautiful thing about our community. Generations have patterns. So even if your grandmama isn't alive, because my grandmothers, who were the first two investors in my business, are no longer alive. Now, I'm grateful that I sat at their feet while I was with them, while they were alive. But even if your grandmothers aren't alive, their generation has a lot of common, common similarities. So asking these questions of those generations, elders in your community, will yield similar, if not identical results. And so starting to understand that frame of reference, because what I found about millennials, you know, in interviewing so many people, I really got a shrewd ear to be able to discern not just what you say, but really what you mean. And one of the things that came out is millennials don't want to know what you did. They want to know how they can apply what you did to what they want to do. But here's the thing. If you take it out of context, you might use a good strategy for the wrong outcome. And so it's really important that you align the strategy and the outcome with the context in which it works. And so oftentimes we quickly run and say, oh, well, they did it this way. I'm going to do it this way. With no context, good strategy, misappropriated outcome. So it's really important that we connect those dots. It's funny that you say that because I was thinking the other day, and you let me know if this counts, but, <laughs> you know, our grandchildren, like my grandchildren, God, I don't know what they'll be looking at when it's their time. However, they will be like the first generation to be able to look back at what their grandparents were up to on social media, what they were talking about. Um, for example, on my podcast, they will be able to listen and hear how I started my business, what I was learning, the mistakes that I made. And it's almost made me, it's almost motivated me to share more because how cool is that? I wish I had that for my parents. Sometimes it's hard to imagine my parents as just being youthful or ever making mistakes because I only know them in the context from from when I was born onwards. So that's why all these million pictures taken every second on iPhones that are never printed out are a problem. <laughs> right, right, right. I, mean, I know I got a picture of my parents in their bikinis. <laughs> <laughs> I know what their young love was like. <laughs> but uh, I think one of the things that you said, I'll go all the way to the root of what you, when you started, you do know what your grandchildren will look at. Because... Uh-huh. Because you will be on the road to legacy wealth, they will be looking at what you show them. And what you're saying is the technology of social media and you archiving what you're doing right now and putting it in a trust or a crypt or whatever is going to be useful at when they are of hearing age will be the first thing that they will be introduced to. Because, you know, our families are our first introduction to business. 
I mean, we learn from our families how to budget, how to save, how to suffer through disappointment, how to, to cherish our victories and achieve results and outcomes, how to love, how to curse, how to yell, how to be mad, how to have a time out. We learn everything from our family. So you know what your grandchildren are going to experience because you're creating the model right now. And so it is important, you know, because I have sat at the feet of elders, I mean, look, imagine talking to a whole bunch of grandmas about sex. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. <laughs> and so as a result, <laughs> let me, just, <laughs> I mean, cause literally if you want to look at a relationship as a business, if you aren't having good sex, you're not having good babies. And if you're not, <laughs> babies, you're not building a legacy. It's not continuing. This is true. This is true. So there's so many different things. Wealth is so much more than money. I mean, do you know how to be intimate? Do you know how to have those types of covenant relationships? that are built on trust. I tell you, if people started talking to their grandparents and their great grandparents about sex, a lot of people wouldn't be cheating because when you can get to that level of intimacy with one person who knows you and you know them, that's why it's a blood covenant. You don't want too many people knowing you that way. In fact, you really only want that one person. And so, and then from the fruit of that type of intimacy, comes a beautiful child and that child is born in love and can't help but love themselves and love others. And our community starts to change. So having the conversations with our elders, ones that you just wouldn't think because you don't think that they know it, you wouldn't be here if they didn't know that. And so let's not limit our relationships to chance encounters. Let's get every ounce of value and benefit from our relationships that we have so that wealth continues to elevate its standard. Hey guys, it's Michaela here with a quick word from our sponsor. So the number one question I get about side hustling is how do I get started? And the other day I decided to kind of take inventory of what I was doing in my early days of side hustling. How did I get started with Side Hustle Pro? And the biggest thing that stood out to me is that I was always investing in skill and personal development, meaning, and I like to do just in time learning. So when I was ready to do something new or try something else, I would invest in a class to learn that skill and then practice implementing it. So the rest of my development and learning came from my actual experience. So I highly recommend you do the same. What is it that you want to do? Do you want to finally put up your website? Then head over to Skillshare and take a class on putting up your website. Do you want to get started with social media and you're not sure how to start? Head over to Skillshare and start taking some classes. Skillshare is so great because it's an online learning community. It has over 25,000 classes in anything you can think of from photography to entrepreneurship, even podcasting. And right now they are offering a special offer just for Side Hustle Pro listeners. You can get two months of unlimited access to Skillshare for free. Imagine what you can do in two months, how many classes you can take. But remember to do the implementation piece, all right? So head over to Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. That's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro to get started with your two free months. And one more time, that's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. And now let's talk a little bit deeper about the money piece. As entrepreneurs, a key theme that we have seen more and more in recent years is the idea of raising capital from venture capitalists. And we are now seeing a lot of measuring going on about how much Black women are raising versus others. And in your perspective, how should entrepreneurs approach raising funds? Should Do we begin to let go of our legacy when we accept capital from, from people outside of our community and one day plan to sell to non-African-American companies, for example? So I think, you know, listen, uh, my grandmother would always say, begin like you're going to end. And so if you are an entrepreneur, plan your exit. Now, if you want to exit and get a big payout and you have an idea that has a 10x growth trajectory that you're confident and you understand, then VC might be for you. Now, one of the things that I am concerned about in terms of venture capital in our community and what you said about, it seems as if everybody's running to be that next million dollar baby. And my concern about that is that it's often pre-revenue. 
And so that, I mean, the idea hasn't incubated. You know, my mentor, Stanley Tucker, was like, okay, it's not really not doing makes a difference. If one person won't buy, why am I going to invest in something with the hope that a whole bunch of people will buy? And so I want us to really fully flesh out our ideas before we take them to market. Because some of the negotiating terms that I've been witnessing and observing in our millennial market, uh, it's clear that they're more excited about raising the million and less knowledgeable about the, the strings attached to that first tranche of money. The reality is that your first tranche of capital is your friends and your family. Again, when your grandmothers write the first check for your business, you get cash flow positive and profitable a lot faster than you would with somebody you don't know. When the first people who buy your product are your friends and their friends, you get enough research and development feedback to know how to make that product so much better than you ever could have done alone. There's a reason why that's our first tranche. And I want more people to be able to engage in that tranche so that when we get to the equity table, when we're raising capital and investment, we are clear about what our value is and we're clear about what are the non-negotiables and what are the negotiables. I'm blessed to uh, work with and um, advise certain people who are in different accelerators. And I remember there was this, an accelerator experience that I was in and there was a guy there and he was teaching the businesses that were in the accelerator what to negotiate for the VC. And it was like combat, like war. <laughs> and I was grateful because this guy was genius. I mean, he was a great negotiator. He was very shrewd. He was very savvy. But he was like, look, and they're going to try to do this. And you got to do this. And, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. For me, I want the investor in my company to align with my vision. I want us to both feel comfortable about this. I don't want to have to combat war with them and then not right. sleep at night because their money is in my bank account. I don't want that. And so I think for us, we need to think about the fact that we have always, we have a legacy of coming up with in innovative ideas from the stoplight to the blood transfusion, to the air condition, to the iron. So we are not short of innovative ideas. Where we fall short is the business around the idea and the way to structure it, the way to fund it, and the way to make it sustainable. If you want to exit and sell it to someone, praise be to God, go do it. But if you want to pass it on for generations to generations so that we have institutions, so that your friends own shares of your company like Warren Buffett, so you can be in Omaha and be a billionaire and all your friends are millionaires, come on. There's models out there for us to be able to do it. And so we've got to be creative in the ways in which we are able to get to a level of awareness and confidence about when we do have to go outside and when we haven't gone inside enough to be able to get to a level where we can really see how far we want to take it. The last thing is that when, I mean, because I'm, I'm president of the African-American Alumni Network at the Wharton School, and it's so funny, I was talking to one of my mentees and she's like, I tell everybody, if you want to know the truth, talk to Dr. Jolly. But if you <laughs> go talk to somebody else, it'll make you feel good. But I just am always like, how are you going to make some money? The primary purpose of business is wealth. Sounds like a great idea, but it also sounds like a lot of startup capital is needed. What's your credit score? What's your savings bank account look like? What does this look like? How long are you, how far down the road are you going to take this? Is this your life mission? Is this what you're willing to put your blood, sweat, and tears in? Because the call to entrepreneurship for me is like a call from God. It's taking an inordinate amount of risk for the expectation of a definitive return. And if you're not clear about what that return on your investment of your time in your peak earning years is, I say sit down a little bit, write that vision and make it plainer before running out there and telling everybody some half bank ideas and getting some money that ain't yours so that you can give away something you don't even know you got preach about it. And is it less about who we sell to and how the deal is structured to impact our communities? As I've heard you talk about the Sundial Unilever deal, for example, and how that, you know, you're selling to someone outside of the African-American community, but you therefore, you then are able to use the capital to then bring other businesses back into the community. So you know the phrase, it's not personal, it's just business. Right. The way you get to that level is when you can afford to be there. It stays personal when you can't afford to own the business. 
in the end, if you create a good product, a great product, I want anybody and everybody to buy it. Not just black folk, I want everybody. And so, but when you are upset that other people are buying it, it's all, for me, can you really afford to own the company? So when I hear people like, oh, well, you know, they sold outside of our community. Praise be, because best believe, even though we spend $1.3 trillion, statistics show we don't spend it at home. We go outside. So please don't fault black entrepreneurs when they do the same, because they could go broke chasing our dollar or they could build wealth, building relationship with a customer that sees the, them for the value deliverer, deliverer that they are. And so stop being so personal about the business and the way in which we can stop being so personal about the business is understand business. That, that was a mic drop, you guys, in, in case you didn't hear that. No, <laughs> no I, I really appreciate you breaking that down because I see that question over and over again. And I've even had a guest on my show and someone said, I'm just responded to an email where I shared the episode and said, I'm not interested in this episode because they sold out. Like, excuse me? <laughs> Have you ever tried to grow this type of business? I mean, listen, the primary purpose of business is to build wealth. How do you do that? You earn income, you revenue. How do you do that? You have to sell. And so I could sit here and hold my breath till folks buy from me, or I could sell to people who want to buy from me. And so for me, I think that, again, this low level of business acumen, not just in the black community, I would say in America, period, causes a lot of confusion and miseducation about where the values need to lie and what part of the value chain do we need to hold on to ourselves. For me, it's not top line, it's bottom line. I love the profit that I bring home and I love who I get to work with. And so my ability to be able to work with people who are married to the outcome that I believe in means that they don't all look like me, but they truly understand that the work that I do benefits people who look like me and they see their benefit in it as well. Another piece of this is what you mentioned about instead of focusing on trying to build these businesses and not looking internally at what our foundation is, let's also work on our foundation. So you talked about the savings, the credit score. Now, as side hustlers, you know, and I include myself in this group, we are people who we have, we are extremely ambitious. Um, some of us have, you know, multiple degrees. We're going after it, doing everything we were told to do. We're also now climbing out of student loan debt, right? So we are trying to get to a to a point of being of having a high net worth and having a high savings level and having a high credit score, right? And having all of these things. Do you think it's worth waiting for these things before we start endeavors on our own? Or is this something that can be accomplished in tandem? I think that decision is a case by case basis. But here's what I, I need everyone to know. Things take time. And if you live your life with a lack of priorities, anything will do. You have to set some priorities. And literally, when you align that with your budget, I mean, you can save and invest at the same time. You can save for the future and invest in your now. You can do a variety of different things if you write that vision and make it plain. And for all intents and purposes, that's a business plan that makes some sense, not just to you, but to some other folks. And so what I find is that we are in a rush to repeat patterned mistakes generations after generation. There are four roadblocks along the narrow road. When I talk to so many of our beautiful Black people about building wealth together and getting to the promised land together, I said, do you think it's possible? <laughs> so many people said no. And the number one reason was a lack of trust. We don't trust each other. When you data mine five terabytes of data the way I have, what underlies a lack of trust is a lack of priority. I mean, I can't trust you with everything. I'm so grateful to be a client of yours. I wouldn't have my own podcast if I hadn't. If you hadn't come to me and said, you have to have a podcast. And I hadn't been truthful with you and said, I was raised by a mama who said, show thyself approved and don't embarrass the family. So I <laughs> learn how to do it. And then you were patient with me. 
because it took us two years to get here. Right. So my thing is things take time. But guess what? If I had started a podcast two years ago, I probably wouldn't be as proud as I am about the results of the Legacy Wealth Initiative. It probably wouldn't be expanding the way it is. And I probably wouldn't even be looking to do even more in communities across the country. And so now is the perfect time for me to do a podcast, to be able to engage others and have conversations. And we found the right time to be able to do it, you know, as par the excellence found in Side Hustle Pro. And so literally, I mean, things take time. So in in my book, which I do encourage people to read, what you're describing is called the storm. And the storm is when you are doing everything by yourself and you are moving fast, but you are really going nowhere because it's not sustainable. And so I understand what you're talking about in terms of Side Hustle Pro, but there's one word in your business title that I rebuke and it's called hustle because (laughs) and I don't rebuke you because I love you and I'm a client. But the true definition of hustle is to shove. And as I've shared with you before, all business is is a series of relationships. And best believe if you shove me, there will be no relationship. And so I tell people, while I rebuke the hustle, I recognize that the hustle is a short-term strategy for an immediate outcome. It can't be a long-term strategy for a series of short bursts of progress that aren't sustainable. And so, yeah, get your hustle on, but get it off so you can be about your business. That's what I'm saying. And that's what you have allowed me to do. Where, listen, if anyone who is not a client of Side Hustle Pro and wants a podcast, I encourage you to do so. Now, it is similar to my warden experience, drinking water through a fire hose, but what I (laughs) about your method is that you walk us through, you think it through, And whenever I got stuck, and you know me, when I get stuck, I get a little, you know, and you're like, all right, wait, hold on. Now, where are you? (laughs) Okay, let's what? Let's break this down to steps. And that's what I needed. I needed clarity. And you gave it to me. And so the ability to have that, that's all you need. And so that is also a key thing for side hustle lures, right? You got to be able to afford to get beyond the hustle, which means that you got to make investments, in a system and a structure and a plan that'll be sustainable past your hustle period. That's getting out the storm. And so I really want people to understand that things take time. Yes. You rush to do everything at once, you will get tired, extremely tired. And tired people can't be their best. That is such a good reminder for me. And you're right. You're right about there, that is the connotation of the word hustle. And sometimes we get so caught up in this hustle and grind mentality that we forget. The whole point of the side hustle for me is that you make sure that you maximize the time you have when you're not working to work on your dreams. And you're able to do it on the side because you value the income that you're getting and the capital that you're getting that you can then invest in your side side business while you're growing it and scaling it on the side. That said, you're laying that foundation. You're not rushing it. You're not quitting before it's time. You're not um, seeking early validation just to get validation and there's no foundation there because that's another trap we fall into. And and you and I have spoken about this, about there's this tendency in society to reward people for what they say they're going to do rather than what they did. I know. And And it traps us. Completely. (laughs) I mean, that's this whole social media game. I mean, I had people come to me and they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. In the narrow road, speech is less. I don't tell nobody Mm -hmm. what I'm about to do. I will tell you what I've already done. And I will invite you to work with me to build it to scale. But I'm not going to tell you what I'm about to do. That's trade secret. And so as a result, like, I mean, proof is in the pudding. I, my mother raised me, show thyself approved. Well, Pamela, where is it? Well, you read that book. Where's the report? You, what does that word mean? My mother constantly was like, show me, show me, show me, show me. Don't tell me, show me. And so being raised by a mother like that, I, I have to show myself approved. And so when I think about us, we are quick to talk, Lord have mercy. 
And I just feel like just do a little bit of that, baby. And let mm-hmm. me know where you get stuck because you're going to. But continue to move forward. And that's one of the quickest questions that anyone who understands business can quickly ask an entrepreneur and quickly know what stage of business they're in. So what are you doing these days? Oh, well, I'm doing this and then 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 I'm doing, oh, okay, great. You making any money? (laughs) (laughs) You sleeping? (laughs) You eating regularly? You taking care of yourself? And so literally, What's the one thing that can fund all them other things? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that I can do. My mother, my mother prays with me before every single keynote. And she's always, it's a, it's a, it's a, a funny like joke that we have right now. Because she'll be like, okay, Snow, what are you about to talk about? I was like, mom, repeat after me, legacy wealth. That's the only thing I talk about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So now what are you about to talk about? <laughs> I'm just like, repeat after me, legacy wealth. And people will come up to me and say, oh, Dr. Jolly, you could do this and you could do that. And you could do this. I'm like, yeah, I could. But you know what I do best? What I'm doing right now. And so why don't you go do that? And then maybe you'll build legacy wealth and you might want to hire me. <laughs> so it's like, it's just like you just stay focused. And that's what the narrow road is about. The narrow road is narrowed by your choices. We have so many different options. And your generation, my Lord, you have so many different options. But a lot of those options are distractions. And I want people to understand, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a fellowship called the Vanguard Fellowship. And it's run by Be Me, which is run by this amazing black man named Trabian Shorters. And he has just a way of defining things. And he defined a conflict, oh no, a distraction, as something that if you address it, you will not reach your goal. If you address it. And when you think about that, how many options do we have in our lives that even if we spend 15, 20 minutes, that's 15 and 20 minutes that take away from us fully concentrating on our next goal, our next outcome, what really matters. And so priorities, you really have to make some choices. So many people, so I I work with a lot of black men and I love black men, but I tell them, listen, married black men live longer than single black men. And so I know you got a lot of options. Oh, she likes you and she likes likes you. (laughs) You better tell them. (laughs) But which one do you love and want to build a legacy with? Which one do you want to come home to? Which one do you want to build with? Which one do you want to admit that you might not have all your money together? But if you guys work together, you could do it. And so make a choice. My grandfather would say in life, there are many options, but there's just one choice. So he would say, never be an options girl. I didn't raise no options granddaughter. And so literally, women, as you date these beautiful men, are you an option or are you their choice? And even if you love them to life, but you an option, they will make another choice. Even while they're choosing you temporarily. Make sure you are a choice. Because women, as I tell everyone, men, you've got powerful seed. But if you want to birth something, you need a womb in the room. Women, we are powerful. We are capable of birthing something from the unseen to the seen. Cherish that power. And choose wisely how you want to use that. That's birth in a business, birth in a relationship, birth in a family, birth in a community, both in a movement. But truth be told, you got to have the right seed. So one last thing that I'd like to touch on before we jump into the lightning round is this article that I read recently. It's by Angie Chapman for Business Insider, and it's titled, When My Mother Died Without a Will, I Learned a Big Lesson About Money Management as an African-American. And she talks about that when her mom died, they lost the home because she died without a will. They lost their mom's home. And in this article, you are quoted and you speak about the fact that, unfortunately, this scenario is not uncommon. And according to some estimates, about 70% of African-Americans die without a will. Why? And what can we do about this? How can we make sure that money management is taught at an early age? So this is a wonderful way to connect the dots of what we've talked about. And I just have to say thank you. I love talking to you. But uh, 
So in this article, um, this, I, was in, I was in Martha's Vineyard. I have an event every year with Gina Collier. She owns a company called Rise, and she was one of my first clients on the narrow road. And we talk with parents whose children go to independent schools. And she, the woman who wrote this article was there. And when she heard me talk about legacy wealth, she's like, I got to interview you for this article. And she talked about her mother. Now, I don't know if people are familiar with asset framing. Again, this is Trabian Shorter's work. Um, and as a part of the fellowship, I was able to really understand it. And oftentimes we frame a lot of problems in the black community for the problem part, the negative, not the positive. But if you frame it from an aspiration, it starts to change the whole piece of it or the whole outcome of it, actually. So when I chatted with her, I said, look, I'm an asset framer, so I got to look at this from a positive way. So many of our elders do not have wills. From my research, what I found is that they don't want to think about dying and leaving disruption and perhaps separation over the assets they have attained. They want their families to stay together. And because they haven't had ongoing relationships with each other, And with money, when someone dies, they scatter even more. And so it's really important that we begin the conversation about what wealth is in our families early. And interestingly enough, when I was at Bennett this weekend, I talked to a woman from 19, she's a graduate of 1950. First thing I asked, what does wealth mean to you? And she was able to tell me what her daddy and her granddaddy did for her. Now, if you graduate from college in 1950, your daddy and granddaddy have a relationship on the other side of the emancipation line, which is very interesting. And so to be able to look at and hear what wealth means for them and how they had to prepare and protect what was theirs because it had to live on beyond them. And so when what I say to people who say, oh, I won't get an inheritance, uh, you won't get an inheritance if you don't have some conversations. Because the fact that less than 30% of our elders have wills and are still alive means that you could have a conversation and get an inheritance with a pour over will and an understanding of how to build a trust. And then if you call your family members together and say, look, let's go into business together or let's elevate the family business to another level, people start talking about what they really would like to do because they realize that they have the potential to have inherited equity. That's the beautiful thing about ownership. And so, again, having business acumen, understanding the primary purpose of business, understanding how business works, I think would really eradicate a lot of the stumbling blocks that we have generation after generation. Do you think that the quickest route or best route towards building legacy wealth, as far as that first tier of selecting an occupation and and income and bringing in income is to go the entrepreneurship route? So in the narrow road, I look at everything through the lens of business. And I start with legacy. And legacies are African-American leaders. There are two economic mindsets in the African-American community, best identified with the legacies of Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, who sits in the center of them is one of the baddest black men on the planet or the baddest black male legacy on the planet, which is Kelly Miller. Kelly Miller was the first African-American to attend the John Hopkins Ph.D. program. He didn't finish for financial reasons, but he went on to be a dean at Howard University. He edited both Booker T. and W.E.B. Du Bois's work. Now, for those who are familiar, Dr. Du Bois was the first African-American to graduate with a PhD from Harvard. Booker T. Washington went to Hampton University, my alma mater, and was then hired to run Tuskegee. Now, he did something called the Atlanta Compromise, where he encouraged people not to fight for the vote, but to work in earnest seat at the equity table. And people pit those two together. Du Bois was talking about the talented 10th, and what I affectionately say Booker T. Washington was talking about was the necessary 90. Kelly Miller was in the middle saying it wasn't an either or, it was a both and. If the earners, the people who choose to work for other people, would use a portion of their earnings and invest in the owners, the ones who want to build up enterprises in the community, the return on investment would build wealth for both sides. And the increased investment would allow them to expand and progress to an institutional level. 
The reality in the black community is that post Brown versus Board of Education, we got some financial products. It came with redlining, it came with some pretty subprime mortgages, which are repetitive patterns, but we really left our own communities, which were closed loop economic circles, to go elsewhere with debt that was never fully repaid. We need institutional growth. Where are our black organizations or our institutions and businesses who are more than four generations old? What, what do they look like? What is their revenue size? What is their asset size? If we don't understand that, that there is a need for that, one of the things that I find with a lot of my mentees, some of them don't want to work for majority institutions, but they want, they worked hard, they got great education and they want high incomes and they deserve that. But we need to catch up on our enterprise side because Lord knows we need their intellectual capital, but we shouldn't make them give it to us at a discount. So we must elevate our standard of business to wealth. And so it's all there. We have it all. We just need to connect the dots. And you start by taking care of the business of you. There's an African proverb that is very big in the narrow road that I use. And it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, we must go together. For me, going far is taking care of the business of you and elevating its standard to the point of investment and then investing in the business of us so that our standard of business is relative to not just what we consume, but also what we are willing to invest in so that it can grow bigger and bigger across generations. Amen. Okay, now we're going to jump into the lightning round. You just answer the very first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, what is a practice that has helped you in growing your own legacy business with Torch Enterprises? To not fight, focus on a win. To really look at things that have come before me and figure out how to elevate the standard, take it to another level. Number two, what's the best book in addition to The Narrow Road that you can recommend for Side Hustle Pro listeners who are at the start of the legacy wealth building journey? I think that everyone should understand finance and business. One of my favorite books is called Dangerous Dreamers, and it's, it's by Robert Sobel. And it really talks about the financial innovators from Charles Merrill, who created Merrill Lynch, to Michael Milken who was uh, a Wharton grad who got the first Marcus Garvey Award for 100 Black Men, but really opened up the debt and capital markets to Jews and Blacks. Went to jail for it. But really, you get to see how our current financial markets that we have and participate, hopefully participate in now, how they were formed by innovators and dangerous dreamers. Love it. Never heard of it. All right. Number three, who is a Black woman entrepreneur that motivates you and why? So to answer that, you have to first understand how I define entrepreneur. It's someone who takes an inordinate amount of a risk with the expectation of a definitive return. Uh, doctor, not doctor, Antoinette Malveaux is a mentor of mine. She's a working class of 85 um, and she's just an amazing woman who will listen to me. She's got a strategic mind. She's willing to take risks, but she connects dots to make things happen. And she's remained connected with me as I with her. And it's really helped me throughout the mm. course of my career. Number four, what is a non-negotiable part of your day? Oh, um, non-negotiable. So I have to, I get up around four thirty, five o'clock in the morning. Um, and between five, once the clock strikes eight, there's a different time cadence in the world, but between five and 8 AM, I am the most productive. And so I can get more things done in those three hours and some people get done in their whole day. And so I have to have that time. Love it. And then finally, number five, what is your parting advice for Black women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, who want to build legacy wealth? And all of this is intimidating to them, Dr. Jolly. <laughs> uh, I live by the principle, whatever you believe, mm -hmm. you're right. And that which you fear, you attract. So if you are fearful about losing your paycheck, you will. And that means you might need to build up a reserve, which means that your business plan has got to include a reserve 
that builds some confidence into your pursuit. Um, you, I tell everyone, you become a different entrepreneur when you have $10,000 in a bank account that you don't have to touch. And so um, I have a mentee who just came back to me. She's been out of, she left her job a year ago and she didn't like it when I said it, but I was like, you got to save up a year because she has a beautiful family. She's got children and a beautiful husband. And I said, look, a, a hungry, broke entrepreneur can't negotiate. Hmm. They have to do what they have to do. And so if you negotiated to get your job, you definitely need to negotiate with them four jobs you're about to take when you start your own business. And so make sure you build your business on solid, fertile ground. Love it. So I know people are going to want to reach out to you. What's the best way for them to get in touch after the show? Sure. So um, I'm Twitter is at Pamela Jolly. Uh, Instagram is also at Pamela Jolly. Um, on my website, uh, which is PamelaJolly.com, there's a click link where you can schedule a quick check-in with me. Um, of course, Torch Enterprises gives you an, a highlight and a lot of updates about some exciting things that are coming down the road. And in a very short period of time, the Jolly Journey podcast will come out. Woohoo! I'm going to have a Facebook group where people can interact with me directly um, after, um, will you tell me, since you're the expert, after a series. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. I'm following you. Peter. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yes, we're going to get you all the way launched. And you guys, I'll be sure to share when Dr. Jolly launches the Jolly Journey podcast, which I'm really excited about. I, you know, I hope that you were able to glean as much as possible from this episode. It's clear we could go on and talk for several episodes, but our time has come to an end. So thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair, Dr. Jolly. And there you have it, guys. Head over to sidehustlepro.co slash Pamela Jolly for all of the show notes, the links to the books, and everything that Dr. Jolly mentioned, including all of the resources. Thanks so much again, and I will talk to you guys next week. Hey, hey, thanks for listening. Now stay connected in between episodes by texting Side Hustle Pro to 44222. You'll get my weekly Six Bullet Saturday newsletters where I share what I'm up to, what I'm reading, my business tip of the week, and resources to help you grow your side hustle. And I'm working behind the scenes on some live events, which my email list will get access to first. So make sure you're in the loop. Text Side Hustle Pro to 44222 or visit sidehustlepro.co slash SBS. Thank you.